So many of you know who we are, but for those of you who don't, we'll just do a very quick introduction so you understand why we would be giving information on how to pitch your book. All right, uh, literary agent for 20 years, author of uh, nine books, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, and um, mother of my child, not that that has anything to do with her credentials, but uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, David, author of 16 books, national bestseller in there, book on the cover of the Sunday New York Times book review, and um, uh, let's see, what else? Can someone uh, get our phone, please? Yeah, seriously. <laughs> We're doing a webinar. Um, so, uh, uh, and David writes in all different categories of the bookstore, as do I. So we have experience pitching many different types of books. I'm going to go shut that phone Oh, you're shutting the phone up. So we have heard approximately uh, 20,000 pitches uh, through our business, where we consult with authors, and through the events that we do around the country, and in my life as a literary agent. So we feel uniquely qualified to talk about the pitch. And uh, we the first thing we want to talk about is why the pitch is so important. Um, because lots of people struggle so much with this and you know really don't even understand what's the point when your book is the most important thing. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people uh, don't understand, people who aren't in the business don't understand exactly what the pitch is and, and, and how it works. Um, so, from the first time you decide to write a book, and you, someone says, so what are you up to? You say, I'm writing a book. And they say, what's it about? And you go, well, it's about a guy and a beatbox. That's your pitch, right from the beginning. And then if you decide to actually try to get your book published, you, the first thing you do is send your pitch to an agent or uh, an editor at a small independent publishing house. And then... That agent, after they've pitched the editor, let's say the editor is interested, then the editor takes your pitch to their editorial board and pitches to the publisher, editor-in-chief, other editors, etc. Let's say they buy the book. Then the publicity and marketing department goes out and pitches the media, and the sales department goes and pitches the various accounts that would eventually sell your book, like independent bookstores, Barnes & Noble, maybe Target, these kinds of places. And then once your book lands in a bookstore, you hope that when someone walks in the door that the bookseller is going to pitch your book or that the pitch, which is now on the back of your book or in the flaps of your book, is going to convince someone to buy your book. Or if you're on, if, you, if someone goes to an online bookstore. Exactly. There's a little thing that says, this is a story about a guy with a thing and a dog and whatever. That's, there's your pitch. And if you are lucky, and I hope all of you are this lucky, and I hope we are this lucky, one day when we are all dead, someone is going to be pitching your book. That's true success for an author. So how do you boil your book down to 250 words or less? Uh, many people think it's impossible, <laughs> yes. especially with fiction. Yes. Uh, you know, just seems that can't be done. Can't be done, especially with your own book. Really, really hard to do. You know, it's interesting because uh, whenever I'm with one of my friends, I know exactly what all of their problems are, and I know how to solve all of them. Yeah. Myself, not so much. It's the same with a pitch. It's so easy to. Well, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's so much easier to take someone else's story and boil it down because you're not so emotionally involved in it. It's very difficult to write a great pitch for your own book. It's difficult to write a great pitch to an English anyway. Yeah. So a lot of people misunderstand the purpose of the pitch. The purpose of the pitch is not to tell the whole story of your book. Obviously, it can't be done in 250 words. But a lot of people try to do that. They, and then they end up with what, what is called a plot heavy Pitch. And and why is it not the point? Because the point of the pitch is to get someone to say, I want to read this book. Please, I must read this book. So if you say, oh, and the butler did it, what's the point? Why Who wants you? to turn the page? So giving a sense of, if you're writing fiction, character, plot, arc, voice, voice beauty of writing, all of these kinds of things, are the things that make someone say, I want to read this. And if you're writing nonfiction, 
let's say you're writing some kind of practical nonfiction like The Essential Guide to Getting Your Book Published, which David and I wrote. That book, you want to tell people what they're going to get inside and not in some general way, this is really going to help you get published. Instead, we're going to say, you're going to learn how to write well, we do a perfect pitch. pitch. Okay, we'll do our pitch okay. right now. Ready? Yep. The, the Essential, Essential Guide, Guide to Getting, getting Your Book Published is a step-by-step blow by blow explanation of how to take an idea you're passionate about, make a book out of it, get it published, and deliver it into the hands, heads, and hearts of readers all over the world. Now, on the back of our book, it then has bullet points that list out very specifically the things that you're going to take away from this book. And with practical nonfiction, that's essential. Now, if you're writing narrative nonfiction, like memoir, uh -huh. uh, then it needs to read more like fiction. Right. The pitch is a sales tool. I hate to put it in such crass language in a way, but that's really what it is. And the fewer words that you can use to make somebody go, oh my God, tell me more, I must have this, the better for you. Our pitch is 19 seconds long. Uh, and what, it's probably a hundred words, something like that. Uh, we say 250 words, but we have half that many. Um, people don't realize that, oh wow, we just, we just lost everything here. No, we didn't. I'm just looking at the question. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, so, people don't understand how, overwhelmed and inundated people are in the publishing business. So the fewer words you can use, the better for them and still convey that sense of how valuable your product is. Uh, so there's actually two kinds of pitches. One is the long pitch. Long is 250 words, one minute. And then the elevator pitch is the time it takes for the elevator to get from that floor to this floor. So it's four or five words. Uh, we, the elevator pitch for our book is um, what to expect when you're expecting of publishing. So we took a book from a whole other category and, a, and just tweaked it. So you see that the promise of that book is you're going to find out everything you need to know about giving birth to uh, a baby. And we apply that. You're going to find out everything you need to know about giving birth to a book. Uh, one of our favorite pitches, which this pitch sold this book in like seven seconds. Okay, ready? The elements of style for fruit, fruit trees. trees. And this is a book about how to care for backyard fruit trees. Elements of style, fruit trees. And it took me one phone call to sell that book because it was so clear what it was. And not only is it clear, it's also what the book is, it's also clear that the person who wrote it has a very sharp mind and understands how to explain things very quickly in a way that make us, that's kind of counterintuitive. It takes you a second, you go, oh, and then you go, oh, I see. Yes, that's quite brilliant. Yeah. Your pitch is your audition to show what a beautiful writer you are, what a fantastic thinker you are, how you can explain your ideas in a way that is easy for everyone to understand. So some tips um, for great pitches, and then we're going to get into all the questions, and we're also going to read a few pitches as well. Yeah. Um, and if there's anyone while we're doing this who wants to post your pitch in the question field, then um, we're just randomly going to pick ones that come up. But if you want your pitch to be read, that's the place that you should put it. So um, w one of the things that we like to say all the time is that a pitch is like a poem. Yeah. Every word counts. You have so few words to make your pitch great, so you can't have any repetition. We see this all the time. People repeat, 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 repeat. So no repetition. The words themselves have to be words that perfectly express the voice of your book. So another lesson that we say all the time is don't tell us your book is funny. Show us. Don't tell me it's funny make me laugh. Don't tell me it's thrilling, make my heart pound. Don't tell me it's sad, tragic, romantic, make me cry, make my heart go pitter-patter. It's it's like those those people that wear those t-shirts that say sexy. 
Like, let me be the judge of that if you don't mind. <laughs> Um, okay, so someone is saying in the chat that the long pitches don't fit. So what we're going to do is um, if you have, instead of putting them here, email them to ariel, spelled A-R-I-E-L-L-E, -E, at thebookdoctors.com, and we'll be checking the email address uh, while we're doing this if you want to send them there. Thank you, Christy. Christy put it up in the chat box so that you can see the address and just click it directly. So, uh, if you are pitching a book that has a plot and a narrative, mm -hmm. the most important thing you can do is make us fall in love with your hero. And when I say hero, I'm just doing a consultation. Someone said, well, my hero, my my protagonist is not very heroic. They're not really a hero. I don't mean that. I don't mean that they're always saving puppies and orphans and nuns. That's not what I mean by hero. Hero's journey, Joseph Campbell. The idea that the main character has a journey that they're going through, right? So for you to make us emotionally connect to that hero, protagonist, in a way that makes us root for them to succeed at something, both in the world and inside themselves, because every one, every character that I can think of from, from a great book that, that I connect with and bond with has some problem that they're trying to solve, that they, they, they can't get what they want. Usually a combination of something out in the world that's stopping them and something inside themselves, a flaw, they're flawed, they're broken in some way. And we need to understand that. And you can't tell us, my hero is a broken character who's trying to save the world. That's telling. You want to show us, create a scene. This is your audition to show us that you can create a scene economically and quickly that makes us go, oh, I see who that character is. And I, uh, I sure hope they succeed at doing that thing and fixing the thing that's broken inside of them. Next thing, generalities versus specific. Right, sure. Cliche yes. versus detail. Originality. Yeah. So we see all the, the thing with the beautiful princess. Oh, okay. That's yeah, I'll great. tell you the beautiful princess. So I was working with someone um, uh, during consultation on their pitch, and they talked about uh, the the first line talked about the beautiful, the beautiful princess. princess. Now I don't know about Whoa. any of you out there, but I fall asleep. I hear that. It just right? doesn't it doesn't evoke anything. Nothing. There's nothing, nothing that comes to mind because no. it's so generic. So I asked the person, "Can you describe this beautiful princess? What makes her beautiful?" And one of the words that the woman said was sparrow boned. She was sparrow boned. That's like a poem. Now that, I mean, you just see it immediately. That word suddenly made her a poet as opposed to someone who's just telling another fantasy tale that I've heard nearly 20 times. <laughs> enough. A billion times, yes. Yeah, so yeah. the details are so crucial and, and people you know, often, and, and to give credit to people doing their research, often you do read the back of books and you see that it says, a beautiful, a beautiful princess. princess. But that's not going to get you a book deal. No. And uh, while professional copywriters do sometimes rely on cliche, you can't because you're trying to get in that door and that's for people who are already there. So uh, the way I explain a, a pitch is that it's a little bit like a trailer for a movie. So we open up a close up of our hero engaged in an action, in an activity that displays who they are. So if it's a romantic comedy, we see our hero meeting the love interest, who they hate, who later they're going to fall in love with. If it's an action, if it's a James Bond thing, he's flying over a, the train in a motorcycle and he's being shot with whatever's. You know, if it's a documentary, you see someone sitting there with black and white, perhaps looking you know, forlornly at the, at the camera. Whatever the genre is, they all have their tropes, but we see our hero and we bond with them. And then the camera pulls back and we see the world that we're going to inhabit, that this story is going to take us to. And then you hear that kind of voiceover in a land where time forgot, where a man was on a mission to blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. So you tell us some of the stuff that is going, the, the themes and the ideas of the book. And then in a trailer, you usually see three pieces of action. 
boom, 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 each of which is more exciting than the one before of it, for it, each of which builds to a crazy climax where it seems like everything is going to go wrong and our hero can't possibly succeed. And that's where you leave us, dangling with our fingertips off the cliff. So another thing that a pitch can show in 250 words or less is if you have plotted your book well. People are shocked by this. They think, that it, how can that possibly be? We see it all the time. And this applies to narrative nonfiction as well. That we can see that there are plot twists, unexpected things that happen that are exciting, uh, you know, heart, uh, heart stopping events, all kinds of things can be displayed in a pitch to show that you know how to build your book properly. So if it seems impossible, it's actually not. And in fact, do you want to say the thing about crying? Yeah. Someone uh, at a pitch palooza recently made my wife cry in 11 seconds. 11 seconds made my wife cry. Now, I've been married to her for quite some time. I've never been able to do that. Okay, we're going to start looking at some questions here, and then we'll uh, also put in some, uh, some pitches. Um, okay, let's put that one up. The question is, must I have a blog and a zillion Twitter followers? <laughs> what other ways? Yes, you do. That's the only way to get a book deal is to have a, actually a, a squazillion Twitter followers, technically. Uh, what other ways are there to meet readers, writer, people? Okay. So, so the joke that we say all the time yeah. is that the easiest way to get a book deal today is to have one million Twitter followers. And that they're all going to buy your book. Yeah. Now, that said, do we think you need a million Twitter followers? No, we absolutely do not. Between us, we don't have a million Twitter yeah. followers. And between us, we're the author of 27 books. So no, you don't. In fact, many writers don't engage in social media. Many famous writers, all kinds of writers. And, and we get you know, all the time when we're doing conferences and stuff, we get people who say, please tell me I don't have to be on Facebook. Do I have to really? No, you don't have to be on Facebook. You don't. However, you do have to find a way that suits you to engage with the people who are going to be passionate about your book in whatever way that is. Uh, a great way to meet, I think, the other part of the question, a reader, writer, people, there's, you know, there's online now and then there's in real life. We're huge advocates of the writer's group. Yeah. Find a writer's group you love. Um, book conferences, book writer's conferences. conferences. Uh, meeting people in person in that way can really advance someone's book career. And it's relevant to the pitch. And I, I, let's just talk about this for a sure. minute. Writing and perfecting your pitch in isolation is not going to happen. No, it's it's not, not going to go well. No. So, like, for example, the pitch that we read, that we uh, performed for you guys at the beginning of this, um, that was developed over many months with input from lots and lots of different people. So yes, you have to practice it all the time and you can videotape yourself, but actually doing your pitch to others is extremely important. In fact, from now on, whenever anyone asks you what you're doing, you say, I'll tell them I'm writing a book. And when they say, what's your book about? You say, yeah, that's your one minute. You got one minute to pitch your book. By the way, um, Christy, uh, who's uh, sort of running the show here, uh, is part of a fantastic uh, writers conference called James River Writers, mm -hmm. and it's it's an unbelievable writers conference. It happens every October, and the reason that we're such strong uh, proponents of the writers conference festival, book festival kind of place to begin with, is there are so few places where you could actually get face time with an agent, mm -hmm. with an acquiring editor, where you could sit down and talk to them. And we've seen over and over again, our clients, they have no professional writing experience. They go to a conference, they meet somebody, they do it very methodically. They, they look at the roster, who's going to be there. They plan out their schedule at 10 o'clock, this person, 1130, this person. And they end up have, making connection with someone that leads to a book deal. Okay, next question. Should we include a bio in the query letter, even if we have not published before? 
Also, should we include any nonfiction publications, even if our work is fiction? We get this question a lot. This is a wonderful question. It's a fantastic question. Um, and here's all the time. So bios um, obviously can be extremely important if you have a million Twitter followers yeah, right. or if you have some kind of expertise, like let's say, or you write short stories that have been published in major journals and this is your first work of fiction. But they can also be extremely valuable for just showing what an interesting person you are. And nonfiction publications, even if you're writing fiction, are extremely valuable. Yes. They show you have writing chops, that people have accepted your writing. You understand what a deadline is, and you yeah. are able to meet it. And you're a professional writer. So, so absolutely, absolutely, anything that gives you cred is excellent. And cred can also be, let's say you've written a novel about uh, where your protagonist is a nurse, and you're a nurse. Well, then we know that the information in the book is actually going to be very real. And that we know that you you've done your research uh, to create a character. So so those kinds of things can be really important. But the other thing is sometimes information that has absolutely nothing to do with your book can just make you appealing. So my personal favorite example of this um, that I talk about all the time is I had a client who's writing a YA novel about South Africa. But she was on the U.S. Women's Olympic bobsledding team. It had absolutely nothing to do with her book. But you see an Olympic athlete and you think, wow, that, you know, that is discipline, dis motivation, all, those, all the stuff. It's just so cool that it made me interested in her when she sent the query letter. Obviously, not very many people who are attending our webinar have been on the United States Women's bobsledding team. No. Neither of us have. No. Uh, so that's an extreme example, but here's another one. We yeah. were talking to a, a woman who, um, she was in her 40s, and she said, I'm having a terrible time with my bio. I, I don't have any credentials. I don't have any, I haven't written anything that's been published. We said, well, well what have you been doing? And I, I haven't done anything. Well, you must have done something for the last 20 years. No, I really haven't done anything. You have to have done something. Well, the thing is, I have 14 children, you see, and I haven't done a thing. Like if you can wrangle 14 kids into a working household, you can certainly succeed in the publishing business. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's do um, this one. Here we go. If you, in your book you mentioned that our elevator pitch shouldn't yeah shouldn't compare us to the greats, is using Sarah Dessen as a comp title okay? Yes, yeah, I, I would be specific. Yeah. Um, so what happens is this is this brings up an extremely important issue, and we actually didn't talk about this about the pitch about the importance of comparative titles. Titles. We haven't even talked about comps. Thank yeah. You. So thank you for bringing this up. Yeah. Um, so comp titles are extremely important for a number of reasons. Uh, one is let's say you're writing women's fiction. Women's fiction goes from the extreme commercial end of romance genre fiction to extremely literary fiction, and there's a bell curve um, between those two poles. And agents and editors need to understand where you fit on that bell curve, and your comp titles help fill in that information. So Danielle Steele and Jody Picot both write women's fiction. Yeah. But <laughs> You're not going to send your Jody Picot-like book to someone who sells Danielle Steele material. They they don't the agents and, and and editors they deal with very specific kinds of books usually. They have a specialty, and this brings us back to research. You should need to research to figure out who you're going to send stuff to, and research in terms of your own book to know where it fits in the bookshelf. Uh, the publishing industry is obsessed with categorization. And you have to know what category you're going to be in, and you have to become an expert at it. We were at a pitch palooza, and this guy was pitching noir, which is one of my loves and specialties. And I said, well, is your noir more like uh, James Elroy, or is it more Dashiell Hammett, is it more Dennis Lehane? And he went, oh, who are those guys? Like, immediately, you go, this is not a professional. This is not somebody who's ready to play in the big leagues. And equally um, as frustrating that we see all the time, because people might have great books but just not understand their category, are people who are writing children's books. 
and right. they'll say they have a YA novel, but it's an 11 year old protagonist, right. which puts you in the middle grade world. Or you say you have a middle grade novel for five to 15 year olds. A picture book for three to 11 year olds. Right. 11 year olds aren't reading picture books anymore. So knowing what publishing professionals call a category and exactly where yours fits in is so important. Now, the other thing that this question gets to, which is great, is who do you compare yourself to? And the, uh, you would think that you would want to compare yourself to the biggest books out there because it promises that your book is going to be a huge success. So we were doing a pitch palooza with a really hardened, cynical publishing professional. And the guy who I was pitching gets up and says, my book is a, a kind of combination of Harry Potter and Hunger Games. And the guy, the, the publishing professional said, whispered to me, no, it's, no, it's not, under his breath. Like, no, it's not. Like, rolling his eyes, like, you're gone, next, ah, sorry. It's sort of like if you're on Match.com and someone puts up a <laughs> photograph that's, like, sexy and fabulous and everything, and then you meet them in person, right. and they're just not You describe anything. yourself. I look like, kind of like Tatum, Tatum Channing, and you end up looking more like, Oh, whatever. whatever. I won't name a name because I was just thinking of one. I'm like, wow, that would be bad. Yeah. So you, it, it's an overpromise, and, yes. and more often than not, you're setting yourself up for someone to say, for no, you're not. No. no, you're not. No, you're not. And it also it, displays that you don't really know much about your yeah. category. It's lazy. Anyone could say, oh, yeah, I'm the next Harry Potter. Even you can say that, but you won't. Yeah. And and uh, and and so displaying a knowledge to say. I know this category so well that I know the books that never hit the New York Times bestseller list, but that but every great. bookseller goes crazy for, every librarian is nuts for. Those are the books that are meaningful to people who are actually in the industry. I think Sarah Dessen is a good one because it's it's not Eat, Pray, Love. It's, you know, it's not Harry Potter. Okay. Um, do you provide private consultation to help authors work on their pitch? If so, could it be done by phone or Skype? Would that include information on which publishers are ideal for the story at hand? Thank you, Mrs. Perira. Um, yes, we in fact, we do provide uh, consultations, private consultations to help authors work on their pitch, uh, to help them fi figure out what book to write. I mean, that's another story, but we're talking about pitches today. Yes, one of the things that is our specialty, in fact, is we're helping people figure out how to pitch their book. You know, she's an agent, she sold hundreds of books as an agent, and she did it because she figured out how to pitch a book to an editor in a way that makes the editor go, oh my, I've got to tell my editorial board about this. And I spent, tell them what I spent, years and yeah, David spent. I don't want to brag on this. Da yeah, David spent years I in Hollywood idea, pitching too. book after. I mean, uh, <laughs> script screenplay, idea, right, screenplay right. idea after screenplay. That's idea. all you do is a screenplay. Yeah. If you're lucky, you get to just go to, you know, uh, producers' offices and pitch, pitch over and over again. And That's all. You and do. we do this by phone or Skype. And what's so interesting? I mean, part of it is we've been doing this a long time. Yeah. But in an hour, no. you know, because you have someone to bounce it off of and because we're hearing things for the first time and we can really figure out what is important, in an hour, you can spend, you know, months trying to do your pitch. But in an hour, we can help you come away with, you know, close, if a not polished a polished pitch. Po I'll say it's a polished, polished pitch. pitch, yes. Right. And we also, yes, have a gigantic network of agents and editors. Uh, in best case scenario, a phone, we've literally got people book deals in a phone call. Okay, next question. Is this uh, Anthony from Chicago? How you doing? Like this is someone we met at the, uh, what's the Printers word? Row. Printers Row uh, Book Fest. I mean, so now we're friends. We met, you know, he came to the festival. We've been in touch now for several years and it, it, it's a great way to meet people like Anthony from Chicago. Okay, hope to see you guys here again soon. Yes, my question is, when you send unsolicited query letters slash book pitches to agents slash publishers, do they actually give your slush pile submission a chance? 
Hell, the Hunger Games is found in the slush pile. I happen to know that because I know the woman who found it. Yeah, so it can be done, can but be done. we have a number of tips to make sure that it does. So a lot of times when you send a pitch to an agency, they ask you to send to like info at blah, blah, agency .com. Or they have this little form where you send it to exactly. on the website. Like the agency that I've been a part of for years, Levine Greenberg Rostan, they have a form. And uh, that form, the, the, those go through and get read by an assistant. However, you can find every single agent's email address actually on our website, but also online. So it's very easy through Query Tracker and other places online to get people's email addresses. Now, if you email direct to the agent and you've researched this agent and know their list and know exactly why you're sending the query letter to them and you open your query with, I just finished your client blah, blah's book and love blah, blah, blah. Or your book that you wrote, agent. Exactly. Then you have a much greater chance of actually getting your pitch through to the person directly. Because if you send it to info at agency publisher or you fill out that little form thing, you can bet almost certainly. And let's take an even an big- An intern is going to read it with a yeah. tiny little milk mustache. Yeah. Uh, or somebody who just- And to take a bigger step back, if you're just blindly sending yeah. queries out to agents and you send you know, your sci-fi novel, to so someone her. who only does me or someone who does practical <laughs> nonfiction, no, you're not going to get a response. So to do your research is, we, we, we can't stress no, it enough. enough. I mean, because we get this all the time, dear agent, she, it says everywhere, a number of places. She doesn't really, all right, she doesn't like sci-fi. She doesn't like fantasy. She doesn't like stories with elves. All right, I don't know why. I do. But every day she gets a query. I'd like to send you my... 17 book series about the unicorns of Narnia. You know where those pitches go? <clears throat> right down the proverbial e toilet. Okay. Um, okay. What if you have a character who dies halfway through but is important in the beginning? Do you include that character in the pitch? This brings up a, an interesting a, question. a, a larger like question. issue, um, which we sort of hinted at, but I, I want to make very clear. The point of the pitch is to get people to say, I want to read this book. So honestly, like for example, one problem that people have all the time with pitches is if they have a multi-character yeah. cast. So you can't have six people in a 250 word pitch. You just can't. I don't care if they're all equally important to each no. other. You got to pick two people. Is it representative of your book, representative of your book? Only partially. Is it going to get people to want to read it? Hopefully, yes. So if this person who dies halfway through is compelling in that way, then absolutely they should go into the pitch. I was reading the back of the Game of Thrones just for, because that's exactly what that book is. And I'm, you know, this, this is like what I do in my spare time for fun. It's really like, I'm such a nerd. I'm a pitch nerd. Uh, and it talks really, the, the, the pitch that I saw on the back of the book was about the Stark family. Well, anyone who knows that story, the whole Stark family is going to die. And the person we think who is our hero, Ned Stark, is going to die very, very quickly uh, in the course of this series. However, they're absolutely prominent figures that this whole story revolves around. So yes, they're the, that's the family. Those are the characters that got pitched. Okay. What about nonfiction? Should you compare to main books that are meaningful on the industry? In the, I think in, or the, in, in the, the industry. industry. Yes. Oh, yeah. So comp titles and nonfiction are just Should as important, everybody. and it's the exact same thing. You don't want to name the number one New York Times no. bestseller in your particular category My book is The New Joy of Cooking. No, it isn't The New Joy of Cooking. It won't be. Yeah. So, so... Equally as important for nonfiction as it is with fiction. Yes, no question. Okay, so um, I am going to now um, pull. Uh, oh, you're going to do yeah. a pitch? Yes. Oh, First, great. actually, what I'm going to do, I am going to read the winning pitch. Oh, we, let me read it. we did this. Um, we did this webinar because we just did 
uh, online pitch with NaNoWriMo, which is National Novel Writing Month. For those of you who didn't participate in that. There was a question, where do I meet writers? National Novel Writing Yeah, so if you're writing Great fiction, place. it's so awesome. And there's all these online groups and uh, just really wonderful supportive community. So we had a winner of that pitch palooza, and we want to read this pitch because it, we think it's a wonderful pitch that displays so many of the things we were talking about. Big Woods by May K. Cobb. When 10-year-old Lucy Spencer goes missing from her sleepy Texas town, her parents, the police, and the township all brace for the worst, assuming her body will soon be found. They imagine her case will, be, will follow the deadly fate of the other recent unsolved kidnappings in the area. But Lucy's sister Leah begins having dreams about Lucy and insists that she's still alive, that her dreams are messages from her sister, clues about what might have happened. As the deluge of grief, I see that's nice, threatens to pull apart the once close-knit Spencer family, 14-year-old Leah, sets out on her own investigation, risking everything in her secure world to find her sister. Carl, Lucy's father, slips away, further away from himself and his family as he tries to reconcile the fact that his little girl slipped out of his hands one morning, while Roz, Lucy's mother, must come to terms with the reality that some things lay beyond her control. But it's Sylvia, a reclusive widow across town, who witnesses something years ago, witnessed something years ago, who might hold the key to finding Lucy, if only she can find the courage to come forward. Set against the backdrop of 1980s small town Texas and the feverish rise in paranoia surrounding satanic cults, Big Woods is a literary thriller about the enormity of grief, the magical bond between sisters, and a small town's dark secrets. Dun, dun, dun. Big Woods was selected as the winner in the 2015 Writers League of Texas Manuscript Contest. Boom! Drop the mic. Okay, so I'm going to start at the end. Yeah. And go backwards. <laughs> right, right. There's nothing that people like more than to know there's Water already something. a stamp of approval right. on this book. Somebody else loves me. Yeah. So putting that this won a contest is extremely effective, and ev anyone who's ever won a contest should put it in their pitch. Now, the other thing that's at the end that I think is fascinating, and David talked about the uh, trailer where you pull back the camera. So when May says, set against the backdrop of 1980s small town Texas and the feverish rise in paranoia surrounding satanic cult, cults, all of a sudden I'm like, woo, ooh, ooh, that's good because we didn't quite get that right. in the pitch itself. And it's further intriguing right. what you're going to get here. And she's just, just dropping that in there. It was fantastic. But we really get this sense mm -hmm of this sort of creepy, interesting, close-knit family that's been torn apart, and this search. Right. And a search is always uh, a, a wonderful great, thing. Yes, and what, what was the quote I read you earlier that was about bottom of the ninth? Or oh, yeah, it's uh, David Mamet. Uh, is it the nature of, of uh, suspense? No, I think the nature of fiction. Fiction, all right, all right. So something like it's, this. It's, this is the baseball. Bottom of the ninth, there's two outs. The bases are loaded. The count is three and two. There's one pitch left. You're either going to be a hero or a goat, and here comes the pitch. Yeah. So I think May did that beautifully yeah. of setting up this very volatile scene where someone goes missing, and then we also have this character of the neighbor who yeah, discovered right, something a long time. Right. What did she discover? Right, right. So there's all that. It's, you know, people say all the time, well, I don't want to give away too much of my story. So they end up you know, giving us these sort of vague generalities and they don't give us anything. And there's people who give us too much. But it's really an art more than a science. And just knowing like how to sort of give us enough to intrigue us without giving too much to go, oh, this is just to go, oh, I get that. And I could just see the, you know, the, the neighbor lady like peeking her head out the, the, <laughs> the curtains, right? And also, she, like, we can tell she has an arc. We can tell that from this story because she has to screw up her courage in order to help save the missing child. All right. Am I allowed to read one? Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, allowed, of course. David's the actor. So. Okay. This is from Bianca Ambrosio, and the title of her book is Gracie. Gracie will do anything to please her mother, Joanne, just so she can have one. When her father goes on a crack binge in Ozone Park, Queens, causing him to cheat and steal from his own family, Joanne, young and tragically beautiful, abandons her role as mother, 
bringing Gracie on a tumultuous ride, complete with mature bedtime stories, creepy auditions, and rock star boyfriends. Michael is Gracie's only friend in the third grade. They protect one another, but the abuse he suffers at home is more than Gracie can comprehend at her sensitive age, and he is taken into the system before she can say goodbye. Almost a decade passes, and Michael has not returned. Gracie is accepted into the notorious fame school in Manhattan, where she starts dating Adrian, a socialite and an even more dangerous version of her parents. Together, they formulate a scam business to target those who want to see their name in shining light. Gracie's mother is still hungry for fame, and she is using her daughter and Adrian to attain it. When Michael momentously appears and John is released from prison after years of total absence, Gracie is forced to face the truth behind her self-destructive behavior and her mother, who suddenly wants the leading role in her new life. So... There's a lot of great stuff. A lot in that of great pitch. stuff. It's uh, you know, uh, it's set in a very particular environment. Yeah. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah. We are rooting for this poor girl who's just like had the life of Job already, and she's only in the third grade, uh, beginning of the pitch. There's a lot of cool stuff in it. Yeah, and there's a lot of very difficult situations. Yes. Um. The the question for me is, who is the audience? Is this an adult novel? Right. Is this a YA novel? Um. There were no comp titles, so it didn't. I was included in there, and the character goes from third grade to high school, but the mother is a prominent character, so that wasn't clear to me. And this is a case where you can see how comp titles would be extremely helpful. Um, it also is very dark, so um, if it is, that's okay for YA. But there's, you know, there's abuse, there's drug abuse, there's all kinds of things going on here. Um, and I also would like to know a little bit more about Gracie herself. Yes. I me didn't too. really I get didn't a either. sense of her. I who she was, exactly. And you know what can really help is a little tiny, like, three word descriptor of what the person looks like. I also found toward the end, there were so many characters that I got kind of lost by the end. Did you feel that at yes. all? Or, yeah. I, yeah. It's just like, it was too, too much. And, and I lost track of our main character. I lost track of our hero, our heroine in this case. Uh, and I didn't quite understand, it, it, like her external difficulty conflict was clear, but it wasn't clear exactly inside of herself what we were rooting for her to get inside. Yes, the world was clear, but I mean, apart from having a mom, and that's just something I feel like everybody wants. Um, all right, should we do another one? Yep. Yeah. All right. The Water Birth by Christy Stevens Walker. Journalist Lauren Calder is drowning. Not only was the pre pregnancy test negative, but she has chlamydia, which she wouldn't be quite so terrible, which wouldn't be quite so terrible if she weren't the local minister's wife. <laughs> wow. When her editor at Femme Magazine sends her to the Appalachian Mountains for the summer to write story series about a natural birthing community she can breathe for the first time in months. At Lightbringer Birthing Center, Lauren works beside the strong, expectant women who allow her to be who she is and wants to be, even as she keeps ending up in the company of the dimple dashing chiropractor from Asheville, oh. North Carolina. Ooh. During her week at the weeks at the center, Lauren moves into a laborious process of finding herself in transition in the middle of a nurturing, supportive sisterhood and a life-affirming water birth that she desperately hopes will deliver her safely to herself. Nice. Nice. So the beginning here is so strong. So, good, man. so you get it. this setup for yeah. the minister's wife. I know, I know. Which is right, brilliant. Right. Um, I kind of want to see more of the repercussions of that. Me too. Uh, because it's such a bombshell to drop, and then I feel like it, it sort of gets shunted aside. Yeah, that thread is so good right. that we don't want to lose it. I know. And I know. especially because we see this other romantic thing going yes, on. Yes, so, yes. you know, has she had serial affairs, or is it her husband, the minister himself, who gave her chlamydia, and is he fooling around, or what have you? Some some hint at that yeah. would have been great. I also think the the middle part of the pitch 
slows down it does a, a little, little bit. bit. Yeah, I agree with that. It picks back up in the At end. The end. But I also felt that um, it got, it sort of lost its specificity and a little bit of its oomph when it starts dealing in the whole idea of your finding yourself as a, as a woman, um, which that's, that is the stuff of women's fiction. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But I don't want to be sort of, I feel like I'm being fed that a little bit too, too much at the end. Did you, did you get that yeah. feeling? Yeah. yeah. I, I more wanted the, the, the sort of specificity of what's going on inside of her versus, you know, what's going on in, in that little world of, of the, uh, you know, the doula birthing natural water birth. But I thing. did get a good sense of journey. I did of arc. It was fantastic yeah. in the arc. We yes. know that this woman yes. is going to transform she's from not, beginning to end of this novel. She's not going to be the, uh, the same the person. Chlamydia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who is with the minister who seems pretty evil. You know. Exactly. Okay. Um, I don't think we should do another one. Okay. So let's go back to questions. It's about um, 10 minutes left. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, let's see here. We have. If you're testing the publishability of your book idea, should you practice pitching it first or begin writing it? Uh, so you're ready in case someone wants to read it. Okay, so that's an interesting question. Yeah. The first thing I do, like I have a list of like 47 book ideas. That's the nature of my uh, maniacal mind. And I, so I pick the one that I, first of all, I test them with people. I ask, hey, do you like this idea or this idea, that idea or that? So I, I, I road test it. All these ideas that I think have a chance of succeeding and I pick one. The first thing I do when I decide this is the book I'm going to write I write a 250 word pitch. That's the first thing I do. Now, I don't start pitching people in the publishing industry. No, I do not. And let's make that clear. Don't start pitching or querying your novel or your nonfiction book proposal until it's completely ready. Because you just pointed out the reason. If someone says, oh, I love that, let me see it. And you go, oh, well, it's going to be ready in about 18 months. No. The iron will no longer be hot in the fire at that point. However, immediately start pitching the book to your friends, to your colleagues, to people you meet on the train, where, where, wherever it is, um, so that your pitch gets better and better and better. Ariel said it took us six months to write, memorize, and choreograph our pitch. And we pitched it all the time. We pitched it to anybody who would listen to it. And every time we did, we tried to make it better. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, what, where is the protagonist age line uh, drawn between middle grade that's and YA? Question. Very specific. So 14 is, right. is really where it's drawn, and 14 is young for YA because the yes. whole idea is that kids read up. And it's a bit old, slightly for middle grade. Yeah, so yeah. that's, that's, you don't see a lot of 14 year old characters for this reason. Yeah, it's because, interesting. Yeah. Because it, it's sort of towing the line between those two things. So you absolutely, you so know. So, like Harry Potter, 11 years old, middle grade. Katniss Everdeen, 16, YA. Uh, sort of. That's, okay. I mean, there's no hard and fast rules, but those are the hard and fast rules. Okay. Um, Responses to pitches are subjective. Yes, they are. So what are good tips for determining how much of an editor's agent's feedback you would listen to when revising your pitch? Love this. Um, so a couple piece of, pieces of advice we have on this. They absolutely are subjective. But if you send out 50 query letters and everyone and people request material and everyone tells you that your ending sucks, well, your, Your ending, ending sucks. sucks. And you have to really read the letters carefully because mm -hmm. a lot of times there's information that's sort of disguised. Um, so if you get a lot of the voice isn't, the I, I'm not connecting to the voice, that it's a general comment, but it means really that the writing isn't quite there I'm yet. about the pitches. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, the pitch. Yes. Okay, sorry. I was talking about the manuscript. So people don't typically, well, you get some response often to query letters like, 
you know, I'm not, uh, this topic isn't right for me. I didn't connect or, with these characters or whatever. Right, exactly. So if you're getting, or if, let's say you're writing dystopian YA, you might get a lot of, you know, I'm just not looking for dystopian YA right now, and that's because it's very hard to sell. So getting a sense of what the industry is looking for can be powerful. Now, let's say you've written dystopian YA, you've sent it out, pitched it as that, and you've gotten all these letters. When you pitch again, you might not want to say it's dystopian YA. You might want to pitch it differently so that you get someone to be interested. Uh, okay. Look, the fact is, the main reason, you're, the main way you're going to judge whether your pitch works is if people respond and say, yes, I want to see your book. And if you send out 50 pitches and nobody says, I want to see your book, then your pitch is not right. If you send out 50 pitches and 40 of them result in, yes, I want to see your manuscript, then your pitch is really good. And if none of those people bite, then your manuscript needs some work. Um, does your book have to be perfect before you yes, to agents? Yes. Let's say you've been working on the book for years, have workshopped it, but professionals have their own ideas of what you need to do, and it's getting a bit overwhelming. Yes, yes it is, it isn't is, it? It is, it is overwhelming. So yeah, what I see here is someone who has worked on their book for yeah, years yeah. and workshopped it. I don't know if you've gotten a professional edit of the book, but um, just to give you an idea of how David and I work, <laughs> David is on the what draft of your novel? Uh, 83rd. 83rd draft of his YA Eight novel. Years. Eight about years. about 10 drafts a year. And five professional developmental edits. So there's a reason for this, which is that we know how hard it is to get someone not just to read, but to buy something. And we don't want to get the rejection letters saying, you know, this was close, but it's not there yet. So... On the one hand, if you've put in all this work, that's a really good sign. You're not sending out a first draft just to see what people want. And at a certain point, you also have to test the waters to know if it is ready. And you're going to find out pretty quickly if it is or if it isn't. So just send it out to a couple couple people just to see, two or three uh, publishing professionals to see. But the, the, the gist of this question, how do you know what to trust and what not? It, it's a really, it's a great question because... Ultimately, it's your book. It's your name on your book. And some of the things that people tell you, you're going to go, no, no, that's not the book I want to write. And it's a mistake, I think. And we've seen people try to bend themselves. Okay, you want me to write this book? Okay, I'll write that book. And it never works, does it? You had a client who the, the, the editor bought the book and said, well, why don't you make it this kind of book? And she said, okay, I'll do it. And it ended up a disaster. Right? Yeah, I, the that? book got canceled. It canceled. Yeah. So it has to be the book you want. I try to, when someone tells me something is wrong with my book, after I gnash my teeth and pull my hair and want to commit some kind of violence, then I carefully discuss it with my team. Everybody should have a team that works with them. Um, who is more objective than you are by the very nature that they're not you. Um, so I run the, the, the things by, the, the, the suggestions by my people. And then I try it out of my book. Okay, I, maybe it'll work. And sometimes they work, and guess what? Sometimes they don't. Okay, excuse my ignorance. Is the pitch part There's of the no cover excuse letter excuse or the book's... It, ignorance. Can I the <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, is the pitch part of the cover letter or the book's overview? And and, and this is an important that question. Is. It's, I don't, I don't do so that. we I don't see a like query that. letter as having three parts to it. The first part is why you're sending it to this particular yeah. agent or editor. Always customized, always different. The second part of the pitch is uh, the, query. the query is your pitch. Yeah. So this description of the book. And then the third part is who are you and why are you writing this? Um, so that constitutes uh, the whole cover letter. So the pitch is a part of that, but it's banked by these other things as well. And usually an overview is more of uh, sort of like a, uh, an exploration or an explanation of what, what the plot is uh, as opposed to a pitch. Can you improve your pitch? Can you repitch? If you improve your pitch, can you repitch to the same editor, agent, publisher? I think absolutely. First of all, sure. most people don't even look at them. So especially if you got no response, right. then you definitely can. 
Um, also, if you're doing it a year or two later, no one's going to remember. So the yes, whatever you need to do to get yourself seen, that's fine. No problem with that whatsoever. All right, we only have time for a couple last questions um, here. Uh, okay, this is a good one. Um, all right. Uh, is it also true that no matter however good your novel may be, if your pitch is poor, your book does not get published? Yes. Sadly. We've seen some fantastic novels that these people just did not know how to pitch their book. Yeah. And they end up enormously frustrated because they've written a good book. And, and what happens, you know, when you're, you think, well, I, I think the book is good. And you send the pitch out and no one responds. And then you think, well, maybe the book is not good. But probably it's the pitch that's not good. It happens all the time. It's, it's, it's I, I, I almost hesitate to say this. And yet I think it's true. In some ways, it's harder to write a fantastic 250 word pitch than it is to write a book. There's a great uh, Mark Twain quote. I'm sorry, I would have written a shorter letter, but I didn't have enough time. <laughs> That's Mark Twain. Anyway, so this is our book, The Essential Guide to Getting Your Book Published. And um, we're very proud of this book. We worked very, very, very hard on it. And in five fact, years. Yeah, five years. And in fact, we have, There's a new, this is a new version of the book. That came out this past July. Which has all kinds of new information about um, crowdsourcing and ebooks and print on demand. And we interviewed some amazing people who are at the cutting edge of what's going on in the quick silver changing world of publishing. And anyone who buys this book is entitled to a free 20 minute consultation from the book doctors. So if you buy this, Send it to us. You have our email the address. Receipt. Send us the receipt. Uh, sorry, don't send the book to us. No, that was very confusing. <laughs> Buy the book and send it to us. Yeah, that'd be great. Send us a proof. People have tried to rip us off. It's really, it's, it's magic. Uh, so send us a receipt of the book, and we will set up a consultation for you on phone or by Skype, and you can ask anything you want. And to. we will go, you know, lots of people sent us pitches. I'm sorry we didn't get to yeah. a chance to read everyone. We will address your but pitch. In Absolutely. the 20 minutes, you get to read your pitch and go over it, etc. And um, normally this would be uh, $100 worth of our time. So um, we are offering this to all of you who participated in the webinar. We want to thank you so much yeah, for taking an Great hour out of your night. Too. Wonderful fantastic questions. Question. And uh, David was not joking about it being his 80 something draft. I saw a lot of people there. <laughs> no, so I'm not. We that's know how, how hard it okay, is to I do write. what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we appreciate the struggle. We're here to help. And uh, we also do workshops all around the country. And you can go to our website and sign up for our newsletter, which lists all of these things. Good night, everybody. Good luck with your book. Bye. Thanks.